So I'm actually an experimental particle physicist. So today, I'm going to use that as an excuse to talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm actually very happy to see lots of people here who are below the age of 30 or so. Because this topic is most relevant not to me, but to you. Because you are the ones who are going to be uh, working in a future in which uh, machines that do things for you are going to be all the rage. And so I just want to use my field as a way to talk about uh, machine learning. So, first of all, I'm going to give you a very brief history. Actually, it's really a misnomer to call it a history. I mean, it's just really, I just pick to choose you know, various things along the way that I want to talk about. And then I want to talk a little bit about the state of the art, because over the past few years, some truly astounding things have happened that I think we all need to pay attention to. They're happening at a very um, rapid rate. And then I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing at the LHC and, and in what ways we've actually used some of these techniques. We've only barely begun to really use them, I think, in a really uh, profound way. And then I'm going to go crazy and speculate about what we might be able to do um, over the next uh, several years and then sort of conclude. So let's, talk, let's start with a little bit of history. Um, so actually, I'm going to go all the way back to this guy, Aristotle, who was, uh, I believe, a student of Plato. And, well, this is a painting by uh, Raphael, but the thing I want to talk about is that he noticed that when people thought in a rational way, a very difficult thing, by the way, right? Most of the time we don't think rationally. That's really just true. I mean, sometimes I've seen people go through red lights in Tallahassee Quite extraordinary. The thing about it is it's really extraordinary because these are people who presumably are intelligent enough to drive a car. And there's high probability that they could die horribly. Nonetheless, they go for red lights. So, but he noticed that when we do think rationally, we think according to certain rules. So here are two propositions. A, she is a physicist. B, she is smart. So what he noticed was the following. Let's suppose you make this premise. If A is true, then B is true. That's the major premise. If now you then assert the minor premise, she is a physicist, is true, then extraordinarily you conclude that therefore she is smart, is true. And that's one of the very first sort of uh, understanding that there are rules of reasoning. Um, and in fact, you also notice the following. Um, however, if she is smart, it's true, you can't conclude that she is a physicist. After all, the set of smart people far exceeds the set of physicists. She just as well, really. Can you imagine a world full of physicists? My God. Um, so, this is really the beginning of, 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 of organizing the reasoning. And let's fast forward now to 1456, um, 400 years before the war. Uh, that's why I chose that date. Uh, 500 years, I can't add. What can I say? Now, but I, yeah, quite, quite. Now, this is an amazing, this is an amazing step forward because before then, you had to go to your local priest to sort of learn about what's in this book. But once it was possible to actually print this in large numbers, you no longer had to do this. You no longer needed an intermediary. And of course, this is also an example of the fact that technologies have a double, you know, they're a double-edged sword, because we all know that books have produced amazing things. And in fact, we have Shakespeare, we have Lewis Carroll, The Time Has Come, The War Has Said, Speak of Many Things, but we also have Man Camp. And after all, I can take a book and bash it over Jim's head. So these technologies can be used for good and ill. We'll get back to that point later. Let's fast forward down to the 17th century. Um, there were many, many ideas and discussions about you know, the nature of man and reason. And as you well know, in around 1650, uh, Blaise Pascal asked the question whether or not it was worthwhile believing in God. And he went through some arguments and so on. So there's a lot of discussion about this. And then sort of later, let's go to in the 18th century, um, this fellow, Thomas Bayes, published um, a theorem, or rather he published a version of a theorem that's now named after him. Um, actually, this is not quite correct, right? Because Thomas Bayes died before 1763, so uh, 
which scored just as well, because this theory became very controversial. And so if you ever want to publish something that's controversial, die first. <laughs> so this is Bayes' theorem uh, that we'll get back to uh, later. And then in the 19th century, something quite remarkable happened. There was a time, so I grew up, you know, I, I was born in the West Indies and I went to England when I was very young. I grew up in the north parts of England where there were lots of mills and so on. People would actually weave and have little boys sort of travel through the, uh, the loom to sort of do things. And occasionally, of course, these children got, uh, got killed. So what this guy did is that he, he basically built a device into which you could actually put in punch cards that would basically determine how the fibers went up and down as the, uh, as the, 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 the whatever the thing is that goes through them went through. Shuffle, thank you. And so this is remarkable because it was the first programmable device. And as you can well imagine, it led to a lot of, uh, of, of strife because all of a sudden you didn't have to have all these people to do the work. Right? And as you well know, at least in, in, the, in England, there was a bunch of people uh, who called the Luddites who were rather you know, displeased with this and had this terrible habit of killing the owners of factories like this. But this became a very important uh, development and led to um, its adoption in many places. Let me just skip through this very quickly because what I want to talk about now actually is this. In 1890, so 10 years before that, uh, the United States government, of course, did the census, and it was all done by hand, basically, tabulating all the results. And it took years, three or four years to do that. So the US government thought, oh, this is crazy. We, we, uh, the country's getting bigger, more and more people. We have to have a better way of doing this. And so there's competition to build some device that would help the tabulation of the results. And so Herman Hollerith, uh, who was uh, a former employee of the U.S. Census Bureau uh, built a device inspired, according to some, by the work of, uh, of Jacquard, a punch card system that could be used to tabulate the census. And indeed, it could be able to do this work uh, in, in a far shorter time than it was previously possible. And apparently, according to Wikipedia, where else, uh, he founded a company that later on morphed into IBM. Now, in the 20th century, uh, Alan Turing, as you well know, proposed a universal way of doing calculations. And indeed, that was very important because during the Second World War, it turned out that it was remarkably useful to have this guy on the team because he was the one who built a device that could crack the German code. And without that, it's arguable that the war could have gone rather differently than it did. Also during, you know, around the same time, uh, these two people invented something called neural networks, more than that later. And in 1950, Alan Turing proposed the Turing test, basically an operational definition of an intelligently, you know, artificial intelligent device. So if you speak to something, uh, ask it questions, and there's no way for you to determine whether the, the person giving the answers or the thing giving the answers is a thing or a human, then presumably you can refer to this as an artificially intelligent system. So we come to the 20th century, uh, 1950 to 2000, and there's a whole bunch of developments. I don't want to go into them in any great detail, but basically there was an explosion of languages to try to capture reasoning in some way. Because the idea at the time was that, well, if only we could actually develop the right language, we could actually try to mimic the way human beings reason. That was the idea. And there was a lot of work done in that regard. But as you shall see shortly, it turns out that we don't have to be that clever, which is probably just as well. A very important milestone occurred in 1997. Um, so IBM built this huge, powerful, room-sized computer called Deep Blue that basically did, did a brute force search of the, of, of, of the moves on the chessboard and actually was able to ultimately, using this technique, uh, defeat Gary Kasparov, who is right here looking very, very sad. <laughs> but this was actually an important milestone because, again, it was thought, well, chess, surely you've got to be smart, you've got to be a Kasparov to do it. But what this showed is that if you have enough 
computing power, uh, you could actually defeat human beings. So that's actually important. And then, actually, uh, we come to our century, 2011, and this is a, a headline from the New York Times, February 7, 2011, Computer Wins on Jeopardy. And, in fact, the person who was defeated by Watson, uh, an Apple computer, uh, Ken Jennings, I mean, he probably had previously won, I think, something like 78 or so Jeopardy episodes in a row, something like that. And uh, his comment was, I felt obsolete, uh, I'd say. Um, so that's actually another important part. And by the way, the machine had slightly shrunk in size. And then something else happened that was, I might have been, my view, even more spectacular in 2016. <laughs> There was a company uh, in Britain, DeepMind, that was bought by Google, and they wrote this program uh, based on your networks, and I'll say a bit more about that shortly, that was able to beat Lee Sedol um, at this game Go. And I said, what's the big deal? Well, this is a 19 by 19 square. And if you simply naively say, well, I can put a black or a white you know, bead on any one of these squares, then there's a lot of possibilities. In fact, another possibility is it's far exceeds the number of, of uh, you know, particles in the known universe. And so there's simply no way, absolutely no way, that you can search that space. It's simply impossible. And yet, this thing was able to beat this guy four to one. Now, the way it was constructed was that, well, it, it simply went through millions of human played games in order to actually construct this, uh, this system. But something else happened one year later. And this is the end of my little history. So, um, so you can see in uh, 2078, uh, Michigan State professors protest their replacement by iPhone 9000. Um, what happened? So let's talk a little bit about then the, the state of the art. So what, what should you know, especially again, those who are roughly below the age of 30 or so, because this is the world that you're going to control. So you need to start deciding how you want that world to be. Well, here's a quote from Feynman. Apparently he, he spent some time in, this, in, in 83 working at this uh, company, and when he was told, well, we're trying to build a you know, thinking machine, machines that can actually, you know, it, it, well, that was his response. But eventually he realized this actually, yeah, this is another point. There's a very nice review, actually, so you'll be hearing this, I mean, you'll, you'll surely have heard this uh, jargon, right? Deep learning, everything's deep learning. Um, uh, one thing I want to convince you is that this technology uh, is, is here to stay, right? It's important, um, but one should be frightened by it. What one should try to do is try to understand what it's doing. And, and here's a very nice review by some of the, the, the you know, pioneers, uh, Jan Lepka uh, from Bretagne in France, uh, Joshua Bengio and Jeffrey Hinton from, uh, um, from Canada that describes you know, circa 2015. But things are, traffic, are moving so quickly that this is no longer state of the art. This is my only slide with equations. And I put that in because, you know, hey, you know, this is, you've got this one equation. And what I want, the only reason for putting this up is to explain to you what is a neural network. Because, you know, with all these advances, I, I think it's important to step back and ask, what are these things really? In the end, these things are just functions. The, diff the point is, if you want to fit, say, uh, data to, a, to, you know, you know, to with a straight line, well, a straight line has a bunch of functions, right? Two, two parameters, A and B. The difference, of course, is that this is a, just a much larger class of functions. That's all it is. And the thing that's remarkable is that in the past few years, people have been, have been able to construct functions, not just with 50 parameters, a thousand, but millions of parameters, and actually fit them. That's, that's the thing that's remarkable, that has not been possible until fairly recently. So what are these things? So just to convince you that this is just a function, here it is. This, this, is, this graph here represents uh, this equation. So in this particular example, you have two inputs, x1 and x2. Okay, and then they're connected to these nodes, and, and you have two outputs. And so x here, so you sum over the inputs, 
and, and these are just a bunch of numbers, parameters. You add an offset, you put this into some nonlinear function, one for each of these, and you sum over them and so on. And if you want to make it into probability, you stick it into this function so it goes between 0 and 1. That's it. That's a neural network. And the, the advances that have occurred have been really different sort of ways of connecting these things together. But in the end of the day, they're just very, very, very complicated nonlinear functions. And, and the thing that's remarkable is that one can now actually deal with these things that was sort of possible 10 years ago. And so we come to this jargon of deep learning. All that really means is that rather than having just a single, a single layer like this, you simply have multiple layers. That's it. Um, and so here's an example where we have a deep neural network with, instead of just one layer, two so-called hidden layers, with in this case three inputs and one output. And so here's the composition. You basically calculate the outputs of each of these, and then the H1 goes into this one, and you recalculate it, and so on. And you can do that as many times as you want. And as you can imagine, uh, the number of parameters grows rather rapidly uh, as you add more and more layers. And so this is, this is what the fuss is all about, is that people have discovered that these functions are so flexible that you can do things such as with recognized faces, in, in, in uh, Facebook, for example. Now, in 2006, something quite remarkable happened. So, so I'll, I'll give you this back up a little bit. So in the 1990s, and I'll say a little bit about it later, um, in the early 1990s, uh, you know, neural networks were sort of the uh, in thing, and in fact, in my field of particle physics, uh, people started to use those things. But then after a while, um, the interest sort of died off, and because people found that what they really wanted to do was to actually um, construct functions like this with very large numbers of nodes and many, many layers. But it was simply impossible to train these things. It just could not be done with the technology that was available at the time. And so interest in neural network basically sort of died off. And people became much more interested in things like decision trees. I'll give you an example one uh, later. Uh, decision trees, and in fact, this guy here, Jim Lillerman, was the person who introduced me to such things. Um, and in fact, it has become sort of the, the go-to th um, uh, technique in public physics, or, or rather some version thereof. So that was that all happened until 2006, when finally, Jeffrey Hinton and uh, his colleagues worked out a way to actually fit these very, very complicated functions in a beautiful way in a reasonable amount of time. And uh, so here's that paper uh, that's worth actually reading. But, and, it's, and in fact, at the time people thought, okay, so all one has to do is to be clever. If you're, if you're clever enough, you can actually fit these functions. That was the prevailing view. Until this paper in 2010 by, by these authors. And I like the title because it's, it was meant to emphasize a point. Big, deep, big, simple neural nets for handwriting digital recognition. The point these authors make in that paper is a simple one is that if you have enough computing power, and if you have enough data, you don't have to be clever. You can achieve the same, you know, same sort of uh, output, same precision of, of prediction if you have those two things. And that's what they showed, is they showed that an absolutely vanilla, well, not, well, let me show you. Uh, so this is the, this is the um, so-called architecture of the network. It has it has 784 inputs because these are 28 by 28 pixel images, right? So you have you have um, 28 by 28 uh, pixel size images of handwritten digits, of which there are 60,000 in this database called MNIST. 60,000 to construct your, the function and 10,000 to train. And they built a system with so just take the graph I showed you before with those nodes. And instead, you have 784 inputs, not two, 2,000, 2,500, 1,510 outputs, one for each digit. So this is some computer probabilities. It gives you the probability that, that this particular picture is really depicted <coughs> zero, and so on. Now, they found that using this technique, 
the error rate was 0.35%, which at the time was the state of the art. People had built very sophisticated device, you know, models and so on to actually train on this data set, but they found this just having a, a standard neural network, a deep network, with enough computing power, in this case, GPUs, graphical processing units, and enough data, you could achieve the state of the art result. That's a very important, that, that's really an important message that, I, that I, I'll get back to later. I mean, the point is, I mean, I mean, the point is this, is that there was a time in the 60s and 70s when it was thought that the only way you want to build artificial intelligent machines was to really understand how people do things. So when I, when I, see, when, I when you look at someone far away, you have to, have to think, say, oh, this is Jim Lillman. If you, were to, if you then were asked, well, how do you know that this is Jim? I mean, you can barely see him. There's no way we can explain how we know that this is Jim Lillman, right? Or Chip Brock. But somehow we just know. And so, but, so it was thought, well, you know, we have to understand how we, we humans do this. Once we know how humans do this, then we can build machines to mimic this. That was the, that's, hence all the different languages and so on that were built, you know, lists and what have you. But what has happened recently is that people have come to understand we don't need to know how people do what we do. You just need to have lots of data and lots of computing. And, and that's how, for example, Facebook can look at your a mere 300 likes and from that, those alone can paint a very, very precise picture of who you are without knowing anything about you, just from the likes that you actually uh, um, um, uh, you know, click on your Facebook page. Actually, even though I, I, I can, I'm enthusiastic about this technology, I'm not quite a Luddite. I'm kind of a... Oh, I'm sold. Put that way. Um, so, so here is... So here are the 35... I mean, this is quite remarkable. Here are the 35 uh, wrong answers. Misclassified out of this 10,000. And... What I want to point out here, which is, which is really quite remarkable, is this. The, the upper, so this number in the upper right hand corner, 2189958, these are the correct classifications. Right? These, these are the right answers, the labels. The, the number in the lower left hand corner, 179, these are the answers given by the highest output of the 10 outputs. But here's what's remarkable, and I think this is going to be very important. If you now ask, okay, what about the next highest output? And so, this is the number to the right, lower right, 1, 8, 9, etc. And the ones I've I, I marked in the circles, these are the, still the wrong answer, even if you go, go to the next highest output. Now, why is that important? I think that's important because one of the problems right now with uh, machine learning, even though, of course, people are now recognizing this, and there's a lot of work being done, is that if, you're to, if we're going to rely upon these systems, we better have systems that can tell us how sure they are of their decisions. Right? So imagine you're, you know, this is 20, you know, 35, 20, 40, and your, you know, your, your grandson is, is driving, is in the self-driving car, and, and then the car sees, you know, sees a, a what, and you kind of decide, is this a picture of a child, or is this a child? Well, that's kind of important to know, right? Whether it's confidence that this is just a picture of a child or a child. And so, one of the one of the questions is is how to build systems that will tell you when they're not sure about their decisions, because because this is what we require. Rather than having a categorical decision, if this is an A or a B, or this is a child, this is a picture. You'd like to know, well, how sure are you that this is really just a you know a, a picture on the on the road? Um, for example, as you well know, there's this problem uh, recently with, with a car that crashed into, into um, the side of a, of a van. And again, I think we will need to have this ability, otherwise this is not going to go very, very well. But this point, the point here, though, is that this was performed, this was, this was achieved with just brute force. Lots of data, lots of computing. And in fact, people... Once, once this paper came out, people realized, okay, so maybe all we have to do is try different architectures, different ways of connecting these things together, 
and, and see what can be done. And so today, uh, there are these networks, again, these are just very complicated functions, right? They're just different class of functions, which happen to be a lot more complicated, which are now used for basically um, face recognition. So there's a layer here, for example, that essentially does a kind of a convolution. You, you, have, you, you have an image, and you basically convolve this image with some pattern, and the other is that you want to essentially compress the image somehow. And the compression basically automatically extracts features from the image. So that is to say, you do not have to decide what features of the image are important. The system basically extracts it. And then this extracted data, from that you basically then do a sparsification. You, you, you extract numbers that are a sparse representation of this compressed data. And then you basically just iterate many, many times. And at the very end, you have just a regular uh, neural network. And so this is, this is the technology that's now kind of the state of the art. This is what people use you know, for face recognition, and et cetera. Um, and this works really well. So suppose you want to go for a walk. So this is a picture of uh, I took uh, way back in 1991 when I went to visit my, my home country, where I was born, in Dominica. And I did something very foolish. I, I rented the car, you know, four-wheel drive, got them in, into the into the rainforest, and told no one. <laughs> I went for a walk. So later on, uh, when I got back and I talked to my, my father, he said, "Do you realise that this place has snakes, <laughs> um, big insects that bite and kill you, and so on?" So uh, <coughs> don't do that. Don't, don't do what I do. But suppose, you want, but suppose you wanted to explore this jungle, right? Follow some path. But you want to, do it, you, want to you want to, you know, let's say, um, yeah, you know, you, you, you want to decide is this particular path a good one to follow? Well, what you'd like to do, of course, is to send your autonomous vehicle to explore, and then come back and tell you, okay, this is okay. If you go there, you're not going to go off a cliff. Actually, this is important because when I was a uh, Right, the young man in my twenties. Um, so uh, there, there's a near um, Munich. There's a little town called Oberammergau, right? A very, very picturesque place. And my friends and I went for a, a hike in the in the Schwarzwald mountain nearby. And you know, you're young, and so you do stupid things. So we decided to sit on our cagoules and slide down this beautiful grassy slope. And we're, whoa, this is really great. And then we stopped. Went a few yards further on, and there was a big drop. So, uh, so it would be useful to have a way to actually explore before you leap, right? So let's see whether that can be done. Well, actually, it can be done. So there's this, this amazing uh, uh, paper here by, by uh, a bunch of authors in which they wanted to see whether, can, I, can we build a you know, uh, something that can actually follow a path. And so what they did was that they took eight hours of, of um, video, you know, lots of different trails, different paths, they, they repeated images, but all sorts of things to have a very, very large database of images. And they, what is interesting to me is that, is that previous attempts at doing this, again, had the old uh, approach. You try to figure out exactly how do we do this, and then try to see if you can encode it. They said, ah, forget this. We have, we have, you know, we have the technology. So let's see what we can be can be done. They decided to divide the images into three categories. Um, so you have all these images and say, well, uh, here this guy has three cameras, and so what, what they did was that, that he walked along the path, many many different paths, with three cameras pointing in three different directions. So you end up with three data sets. And since you know that the camera that points this way will want you to go to the right. The camera that points this way wants you to go straight, straight ahead, and, and, right, and, and, and so on. So you know what the right answers are for the three categories of pictures. And they use that basically to train a deep neural network to decide which of the... So given, given a, a real-time image of the path, in which of the three categories does this image lie? And then take the appropriate... appropriate, uh, appropriate Action. So, I probably did something illegal. I downloaded this because I couldn't figure out a way. So this this is this is a picture uh, on, from their website, which shows 
this, uh, this autonomous vehicle, this drone, that's using this algorithm, but simply is deciding, okay, here's the real-time image, and it's categorizing those images as it's one of those images, one of those images, or one of those images. And uh, off it goes. And so this is really quite extraordinary. And again, the authors have, I mean, they have no idea how humans being, beings do this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, come on. Um, <laughs> Even people go off cliffs, <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, yeah. Now, so I told you before that there was this, in 2016, uh, this AlphaGo program defeated, uh, defeated this uh, Lisa Dole, the gold champion. But this to me is a, a watershed paper, right? Mastering the game of Go without human knowledge. Basically, what they did was to say, okay, we are going to have a computer play itself. The computer is going to basically make predictions as to which of some moves are most likely, and then there will be, and then what will happen is that, is that the computer will then branch off in a, in a stochastic fashion, set of moves, calculate which of these uh, moves are the most uh, uh, likely, and, 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 and iterate. And so what will happen is that they will then compute which of these paths that were tried were actually turned out to be okay, and then use those data to basically update the neural network. And so this is an interesting process where this thing were basically, basically telling it itself. After three days, this program beat the program that beat Lee Sadol after three days. After four day, 40 days, this program beat 100 to zero. The program that beats these at all. And so now on this planet there is actually a program that they, they can defeat any human being in this game. And in fact, the Go players are now using the output of this program to learn really strange new moves in Go. So I think this is the very first time that a machine, you know, uh, uh, can actually is actually now teaching human beings different ways of thinking about the game. Uh, this to me is really quite extraordinary. Another interesting idea by this, uh, see, they're all so young, uh, Ian Goodfellow. Again, a simple idea. Um, let's suppose you're trying to, uh, you're trying to generate, you know, um, Monet's, right? You want, to, you want to paint in the style of Monet. So how do you do that? Well, you could employ a forger. I mean, that's certainly one way, and that's, you know, that works. The visual technique, but you can do it a different way. You can say, okay, we're going to we're going to build a neural network system where we have all the Monet's that we know about, and 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 what we're going to do, we're going to have a forger neural network system whose goal is to basically just dump pixels onto a canvas. So initially, it's just completely random, and then what happens? The the other neural network then says, okay, I'm going to try to decide whether this or that is is from the same class of paintings. Of course, initially he says, ah, this is not Monet. This is, you know, just uh, whatever. But eventually what happens is that as the training progresses, the forger becomes better and better and better at forging, and the, and the, the other network becomes less able to distinguish between the forged picture and the real one. And eventually, uh, you end up with, you know, a very, very uh, highly um, Believable paintings, and this, in fact, this idea. Um, so, for example, the, Jan Jakub Lacan, he's the uh, chief scientist at Facebook, and he, this is his comment. And in fact, if you look at the number of papers published, 2014, 2017, it's just sporadic exponentially. This adversarial technique for actually building systems. And so, one reason I'm interested in all this is that I want to see, you know, is there anything that this can t tell us about what can be done, perhaps, in my own field? That's really sort of where we're getting at. So we come to the, the Large Hadron Collider. And of course, why are we doing this? Well, we're doing it because Newton said so. Right? There are therefore agents in nature able to make the particles of the body stick together by very strong attraction. And it's the business of experimental philosophy, shape and others, to find them out. That's what we're doing. We're just doing exactly that. We want to figure out what the forces are, etc. So so what you do, you ask for several billion Swiss francs and you build a big machine. And so here's this big machine. Um, 
and he's the Swiss and uh, France countryside. And so right here is Cern. And by the way, here we're standing on the, the Jura, looking down um, towards, uh, towards Geneva, which is right here. <coughs> an amazing machine for many reasons, not least of which are some of the characteristics. So you see that the collision energy right now is 13 TeV. Uh, the amount of energy in the beam, these are proton beams, right? Beams are particles. The total energy in, the, in both beams is 720 megajoules, which I'm told is roughly the same amount of energy as the plane that takes me from Paris to Geneva. And crashing at one gigahertz. And in fact, this, is, this machine is so large that when the moon rises above Geneva, the tidal forces between the moon and, and, and the Earth cause is the ground to basically go up about, about this much. This causes the diameter of this machine to change. And controllers at CERN have to basically adjust the orbital parameters of the beam to make sure that particles collide. So it's really an extraordinary thing indeed. And I'm sure you must have heard lots of things about it, so I shout any more and say the goal is to use this machine to do what Newton says we should do. We've done it, right? We've spent a long time uh, doing it, and we have this amazing picture of the world around us. So these are all the particles, the quarks, and the leptons, electrons, and so on, the gluons. Uh, and it, this is a complete picture we have of everything that we know about how particles interact. We don't know a lot about what's in here. So for example, if I go to the next slide, um, these are all the numbers that have been measured. And I label a couple here, the top four class, the people in this room, uh, and I, um, as well as this, we're involved in measurement of, of, of these numbers. And so, if you plug in those numbers into our current theory, it explains all the current data from colliding experiments. Of course, there are things we don't understand, but the point is we should marvel at this. Right? And this is a pure intellectual construct based upon guesswork and experimentation, and yet it, it, is, it is incredibly precise making predictions. However, there are some questions, such as, are the 19 parameters of this theory just random numbers? Or can it be explained? We, we don't know. And it would be good to know. It may well be that these are random numbers, and that's it, we're at the end of the story. Uh, Chris Quigg at, at Fermilab wants to equip, what, what is it exactly that makes a top quark a top quark? What is it that makes an electron an electron, and so on? We don't know. All we do is that we say, OK, you electron, I'm going to give you an electron number. You neutrino, I'll give you a neutrino number, and so on. So we give, we give all these particles quantum numbers, but we don't know what these things are. I mean, the analogy is, if, if you think back to the 1890s, people had lots of information about uh, the radiation from atoms, and, you know, SPD lines and so on. I mean, there's a lot of information about these things, and people had even, even had certain rules about the different uh, combinations of radiations from atoms. You know, N, L, and M. Those are just numbers that people have invented to explain and, and describe you know, in, in some sort of a way what they observe. Fast forward to 925, 26, because of quantum mechanics, we actually know what these quantum numbers, N, L, and M, mean. There's, there's a geometrical understanding of what these things are. And so maybe the same will be true of some of these quantum numbers of some model, we don't know. Uh, what is dark matter? We have no idea. Actually, we don't know. Strictly speaking, even though I know the people here who are looking for dark matter, we haven't actually proven that this stuff is matter. It just seems like the best hypothesis at the present, but it could be that it is not stuff. It's something else. So we should always, you know. But, you know, I'm a puzzle physicist, so I like the idea of dark and matter, because then we can go off and look for it. And then, of course, dark energy is a completely different story altogether. And so we come to the last part, just the speculation. So, so I look around and I see all these amazing things that are happening at Google, Facebook, you know, um, everywhere. People are making, doing truly extraordinary things. And so the question is, you know, well, can we do some of this stuff? Can we, can we do something with this? So the, last year there was a conference at ACAT um, in which Kyle Cranmer, you know, one of these super bright young people uh, at university, gave a really interesting talk. You should really have a look at it. Uh, and he made this 
this point that until recently, what we've been doing in particle physics is basically just classifying things. You know, is this an electron? Is this a pion? You know, is this an explosive event? Or is it something else? And doing regression. You know, what's the energy of this particular particle? So we're using the very sort of, you know, basically to make a better, better estimates of, of things and better classification. But he, he, he says, and I agree with him, that the next, the emergent thing is, is basically using this stuff to do inference, really, to really take the inference to a particular level and to generate things. Um, but let me just, before I, I sort of end, let me just uh, say something about the early days. So, we, you know, if you get all the way back in 1988, when we started to, to use some of these ideas in particle physics uh, through, the, through the 90s, um, and, I, and I have to show you one, you know, a couple of things. Uh, so this peak here at 103.5 plus minus 4.5 GeV was the, the the mass of the top quark that we basically uh, arrived at uh, in 97. And actually, it's interesting to compare this with the current uh, value. And this was one of the very first times that we really took, you know, we really took it seriously. We actually used neural networks, Bayes, um, and it's it's still the test of time. Let's try right. So this is a picture. But but Jim Miniman was the person who told me, you know, the world is not just you know neural networks and Bayes. There are other things called decision trees. So what's a decision tree? Let's suppose you wanted to, you know, so. You could, you could hire a wine taster and say, okay, I want you to test all these wines, tell which one's a, a girl, and, I, uh, you know, and I'll buy that. Actually, if you want to buy this particular bottle, apparently it's $170,000. <laughs> so, so you can, you can be a very physicist about it and say, okay, I'm going to forget it. You know, these wine tasters are just too expensive. Let me use machine learning. So you, you want to build a machine learning wine taster by using a decision tree, because that's what James says I should use. So, so let's suppose you know the uh, sulfur dioxide content and you know the alcohol content. So you might sort of start at the, this root and say, okay, the uh, alcohol content is, is, um, <coughs> is uh, less than 10.7. Uh, yeah. So you go off in this direction and, and so on. So you, by, you make decisions at each point until you get to a leaf. And so if you're here, you say, oh, okay, this has gone down this path, I'll call this a good wine, because it has the right alcohol content and the right sort of electrolyte content and so on. If I go down this path, well, um, this is this is okay because uh, you know, the sulfur dioxide content is not too bad, uh, but if it goes down this path, it's really lousy wine, so I shouldn't buy it. And so you can build you can build such uh, trees, and in fact, you can actually build hundreds of these trees. And each of them is going to be slightly different if you try to different slightly different numbers. But then what you can do is an average of all these trees and produce extremely powerful um, discriminants. And that's essentially what we do right now in modern physics. That's, that's the, you know, the standard technique in Atlas and CMS. And Reinhardt will, will recognize this uh, plot because this is the, this is the amazing plot. Of, so here is where, we, again, we use uh, neural networks, you know, decision trees, um, which, you know, which elements methods, and so on. And what is to me quite extraordinary is that I'm trying to convince you that uh, this very thin blue line here, right, is a thing that we discovered. Look, observation of. So I'm not lying. Right. This would have been impossible to do. In fact, when we began this work way back in 1995, uh, 96, shortly after the discovery of the top, we, we thought this was going to take, you know, a long, long time, actually it took some years in the end, but we thought it was going to take much longer, and we actually did it, initially we decided, let's just use traditional techniques, because you know, we don't trust this new method stuff and, and, and decision trees, but we very quickly came to the conclusion that, that if we did that, you know, we would not be possible. And so here's one of the very first examples, really a large scale example in our field of using these techniques uh, in a good way. But we, we're coming to a problem, however, um, in, a, in, a, in that ten years from now, uh, five ten years from now, uh, we will have so what you, we will have collisions of proton beams at the LHC, in which there will there will be simultaneously as the as the 
bunches across each other, there could be as many as 200 individual collisions between protons, of which presumably one of them is the one that we actually want to keep. One that's interesting, the so-called uh, primary vertex. So here's a picture of one from CMS from 2012. And among, so I think there are 78, if I remember correctly, uh, individual collisions. And the point is we need to figure out a way to say, ah, this guy, this is the one that we really care about, and all the rest are just uh, background that we're going to get rid of. We have techniques to deal with this. I'm, I think it's fair to say neither Atlas, unless they are lying to us, nor CMS has currently techniques that can deal with 200 of those, right? So we need some new ideas. And so given that Facebook can use three of your likes and paint a very accurate picture of who you are, well, maybe we can actually use some technology to do a few things. So perhaps we can build, we can use technology to have something that constructs an algorithm to identify the particles that come from the main collision point, perhaps, automatically without human intervention. Maybe we can have a, some, some system like this that can basically take the data and compress it in, in a way that's optimal, um, that preserves the, the amount of, certain amount of information. Let's say, you know, I would like to have this, the most com compact representation of this data, where I'm only going to lose, say, 1% of the information. Let's say. And that's done automatically. Um, maybe we could have some, a system that can search through the data and characterize deviations automatically, and then send alerts and say, okay, I think something interesting is going here. Maybe it's interesting, or maybe your simulation of the, of the background is not correct. And construct summary reports. Right now, all this stuff is done by grad students and postdocs. Which is fine, you know, that's, that's good. And you should do so. But at some point, when we have 100 times more data, and the number of people stays the same, at some point, we're going to have to start embracing automated systems, uh, or just quit. And come to the last slide. So, uh, in 2017, there was this report by the McKinsey Company, um, and the title, A Future That Works, Automation, Employment, and Productivity. They did a very, very extensive study, I think, both of the United States and also of Germany. And this is what they, this is their, uh, Conclusion. Almost half the activities of people are paid almost $16 trillion to do in the global economy have the potential to be automated by adopting, adapting currently demonstrated technology. And they go further, and they have a very detailed sort of uh, you know, application of this. And the point is that even, even jobs such as the jobs that we do parts of that are subject to automation. And so this is why I think it's important that, uh, again, all those who are younger than 30 or so, it is now that you need to start thinking about what kind of society you want to live in. Because this is going to happen whether we like it or not, because there are companies around the planet who are racing ahead with this technology. Um, And we would like to ensure that that this doesn't happen, right? Because it would be very, very unfortunate. Because I do. What are you talking about? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. Thank you. <laughs>